Welcome to Talking Giants presented by DraftKings. I'm your host, Bob Skinner, here with my co-host, Justin Panic. We got to talk about the tight ends today. So we're talking about Kyle Pitts, Pat Fryer, Ruth. We're going to talk about those guys. We're going to talk about the new coaching additions. We're going to redraft pick 99 from the 2020 draft. Um, and I want to start the show off with a little bit of talk about 11. We haven't talked much about 11. We're going to start off with Justin. How are you? Another perk for Patreon, um, because for the YouTube videos, we only have like the, the speaker mode. Um, so only one face on the camera at one time. As Bobby was giving his intros um, in the intro, I put my arms up to see how sweaty my pits was. My oh, Kyle Pitts. Kyle oh, Pitts, how about that? Kyle Pitts. Uh, I, so that's a Patreon perk. They got to see that. Like Billy Mays, our, our only new Patreon member. And his name is Billy Mays. How crazy is that? Hmm. Any relation? Who's a famous maze? I feel like there's a. Is, you don't know there, who Billy Mays is? Billy, who who is it? He was the he manager. was the um the infomercial guy who died of a cocaine overdose. I thought he was like a baseball manager. Same. Billy thing. Mays here with another fantastic project. Yeah. Oh, Sham Wow. Go look up the Billy Djibouti Dubs, and they're so funny. Excuse me. Djibouti Dubs YouTube. Check it out after this. All right, Justin. Let's get to the episode. Let's talk about it. patreoncom slash talking giants two dollars month. Whatever. A lot of us have been talking about 11. We haven't talked about it much on the podcast, some tweets here and there. But something that's starting to get on me a little bit is this idea that this is, we can just get an offensive lineman in the second in the second round. Like that has been saying, oh, it's a deep O-line class. Justin, I don't think it's that deep. Like, for, for, first of all, like I don't view this class as a deep O-line class. Um. Uh, Landon Dickerson, if he can be there in the second round, I would love him. But the reason he's there in the second round is because he's so injury prone. If he wasn't injury prone, he'd be a, a slam dunk first rounder. Still might be. Creed Humphrey, I need to watch him, but he 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 could be a guy there. There really is no one else. There's really no one else where it's like, oh, if that offensive lineman is there in the second round, I should grab him. And it's this talk about Rayshon Slater, if he's playing guard, not to take a guard at 11. We got to stop half-assing this O-line, man. We got to stop half-assing this offensive line. If Rayshon Slater's there at 11, he should be the pick. You know, barring, you know, there's a, a, a Pitts type there. But he should be the pick if he's there at 11. Fix this offensive line and stop saying you can get a quality starter in the second third round. You know who uh, people in the second third round are? Will Hernandez. That was once Will Hernandez. That is not a lock. And I get first-rounders aren't locks too. But Rayshon Slater will come in and immediately upgrade our offensive line. I don't think there's any offensive line and and round two on besides Landon Dickerson, who immediately upgrades our offensive line. So I'm I'm kind of like st- we have to stop saying that like oh it's a deep O line class because one it's not a deep O line class in my opinion. There's a cluster of guys in the third round I like Ben Cleveland, Aaron Banks, Trey Smith. Like I like those guys, but they're not worth the 40 second pick no. to me. And it's a lot deeper at other positions. Wide receiver, very deep. Inside linebacker. Very deep edge, edge. You know, it's like, hey, edge. Maybe not eleven round two. There's a ton of guys who you could take there. So, like, there's so much. It, I don't view this class as deep. If you're talking about that third round cluster, yeah. But that's you're not drafting offensive linemen in the third round to come in and start right away and be upgrades. And if that's the case, let's just stick with Matt Perrin and Shane Lemieux because those are those guys. Yeah, um, largely what a lot of people are talking about right now. It's it's receiver. Maybe, you know, a lot of, some people are on the Micah Parsons train, which which I'm willing to bet that Parsons is going to be there. Um, receiver or offensive lineman, if Slater or Sewell are going to be there. Um, and now, Justin. Bobby, let's do an exercise. I want to do an exercise. I want to, because you already named offensive lineman who may be available, who will probably be available in round two. Some that may be worthy of that second round pick. Some that maybe are, are not. So let's, let's make a list on top of our heads with wide receivers. I have uh, Tony from Florida who may be there in the second round. Amari Rogers from Clemson, Diami Brown from University of North Carolina, Elijah Moore. Um, is there also, Rondale huh? Rondale Moore. Rondale Moore. Who's a, there's somebody with the first name Elijah. It's Elijah Moore. There's two Moores. Oh, there's two Moores. Elijah Moore and Rondale Moore. So that's what, five, six guys. Paris on... Marshall. There's a lot of guys yeah. like at the wide receiver inside linebacker. Chas Rats looked at it as like a third rounder. And I, I would, I love that guy. Nick Bolt. Like there's, edge you know it's like osai like one of those guys that you like is going to be there so and let's and let's also say if we any of those guys 
I think the Deami Brown type, uh, Elijah Moore, Tony from Florida, Mari Rogers, they would automatically be one of our best receivers. You know, I think they would be right up there with Slayton. That would create a very good problem in the wide receiver room. It would create competition. Um, I think Chas Surratt automatically kind of becomes line interior linebacker too. I think a Joseph Asai automatically becomes our best edge rusher because there's so many yeah. other, other qu- question marks at edge right now for the giants. So all those guys, but if you take, if you wait on offensive guard or offensive tackle, if let's just say we take, we take Dickerson, um, those guys don't automatically become our best offensive lineman. <laughs> no. Dickerson would come in and be, he's the one. Yeah. He's the one, but it's like people, he's, I'm seeing him mocked at like 20 now. Um, and it's because he's worth, like, he's that good. It's just the injuries that have him like as a second round guy. And it's like, and it's, you know, Will Hernandez is, th- is that guy that's like, Oh, just get an office line in the second round. Um, and again, like and then at the tackle guard, it's a little different tackle spots. Like, Oh, Alex Leatherwood. It's like, I'd rather roll with Matt Pear than Alex Leatherwood. Like all those guys who were mocked in the second round as offensive tackles, like give me Matt Pear to like, Let's don't waste the investment of mass pair on a second rounder when he's a third rounder. Yeah. And also um, my, my main problem with, we can just get a guard in round two. Cause that has been the phrase that has been regurgitated over and over and Wyatt over. Davis now. sucks. So why, why it, a lot of people are probably screaming right now. Wyatt Davis, Bobby Wyatt Davis. And you don't like Wyatt Davis. Matt Miller so, agreed, but I hate Matt Miller. So I, mm, I maybe I, I'm going to start liking Wyatt Davis. So maybe you should like Wyatt Davis reverse psychology. Um, So, we already talked about, hey, interior offensive linemen that may be available in the second round. They may not be major upgrades right now compared to the offensive linemen that we have on the team versus wide receivers that may be available in round two. They would be upgrades. Interior linebacker, they would. Edge rusher, they would be. Okay, so that point's done. My my point is, because then also uh, uh, another point against not taking an offensive lineman at pick 11 if they're there is – okay, but you're, we're not, then we're just wasting Shane Lemieux. We're wasting Will Hernandez. We're wasting Matt Parrott. We're not allowing them to develop solely hoping, just having hope, Bobby, hoping coming into a season and hoping football players can develop and putting very high expectations on them that maybe they don't deserve those high expectations. Solely hoping players can develop and putting unrealistic expectations on players has not been working for the Giants, and it's one of the reasons why we have the worst record in the National Football League since 2017. That is what the Giants have been banking on for years. We're just going to hope that O'Shane Zimenez can develop into something. We're just going to hope Lorenzo Carter. We're just going to hope Eric Flowers can develop into something, even though he was a bad pick, even though we know he's not a good football player. We're going to try to move him to right tackle and hope he can develop into something, And, and it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And I have hope for Lemieux and Parrot. You know, Hernandez is kind of – he is what he is. But if we draft Slater, you're not giving up on them. You're giving up on the one who's not the guy. What, you know, you say two of the three develop. Well, guess what? Rayshon Slater is the third. You fit him right in. You've got Gates and Thomas who you feel really good about. Pear, like, you can't expect Parrot, Hernandez, and Lemieux to all make big jumps. You can expect, like, hey, like, Pear, I like Parrot a lot. I, I would hate – to give up on that investment. I really would. And that's why I'm very okay with Rayshon Slater playing guard. Uh, even though I, I kind of kicked against that at first shout out um, Steve from South Florida. Um, so like I said, and like, I'm, I'm cool. I'm cool with that. And, and Shane Lemieux, like I kind of get, I pointed out that Shane Lemieux wasn't as good as people said he was in the beginning. So I kind of viewed as a Shane Lemieux hater, but I like Shane Lemieux. Like I want to see Shane Lemieux develop. I mean, you know, we talked to Rich Soybert, you know, about a month ago. And he talked about like giving up back-to-back sacks in like one game. So like, I, I, I can't wait to see the development of Shane Lemieux. But again, like you said, putting all the hope in there. That being said, with the argument we're all making, if you're still like, hey, I want one of those wide receivers, it's not because Rayshon Slater is a guard, then fine. Like then that, that's fine. Like, and I can see that. Like I'm tempted to say, you know, a Smith Waddle at this point too, even with this argument. But I don't want to hear that the O-line is a deep class or you don't want to take a guard at 11. Right. If you're, if you're talking about Slater. Those arguments I can't stand. If you're just like, hey, I want the – like, you know, some people are just like, hey, I agree, but I want Micah Parsons. I want Devontae Smith. That's fine. Yep. That's fine. But just the idea, like, oh, didn't take guard 11. It's like we got to – we got to stop half-assing this offensive line. And, and they haven't recently, you know. Like, you know, yeah. last year there were some picks. But you can't, you know – you can't just expect all your draft picks to like pan out every right. year. Like, besides, besides edge, I don't think there's any position 
on this team that is half-assed right now. I, I don't I don't think there is. But offensive line, and we and we saw it in the different in how the 2020 season I mean, played think out. About how lucky you are with Gates that an undrafted free agent turned into oh, yeah. what he is. Yeah, well, that that's having hope, Bobby. We had we had the hope we had hope that an undrafted free agent was going to make a position change, and he did. And th- th- those cases are rare and good for the Giants, and not only just getting him, but also locking him up. And now he's here for the next couple of years. That's that's a good situation where you hope something happens, and it did work out. But it doesn't always work out that way. And the un- the undrafted guy who has a long shot, you know, is not always going to make that big jump. Sorry. Yeah. So again, it's not to say that, oh, Rayshon Slater is the only right pick. That's not true. And I'm tempted to say a Devonte, like, you know, when I think of Devonte Smith, who's like, you know, you know, talked about as a Marvin Harrison type in him against Kenny Galladay. I'm very, you know, just saying that out loud gets me super excited and being like, you know what? We should get a Devonte. So I, I, I'm fine with that. But the idea is like, oh, you don't take a guard at 11. Or we can get O line later. I, I I will no like I just can't I can't deal with that. Yeah. Um. So anyways, Justin, some news, some news and notes. We'll go through this quickly. The Giants hired two new coaches since we talked about Russ Callaway on Tuesday. They hired Carter Blunt. Mm. He's coached at Georgia, LSU, South Alabama, Birmingham Southern, and of course was at Alabama with Joe Judge in two thousand nine. But most recently, Justin, he spent the last three years at Tennessee with Jeremy Pruitt as a special teams assistant. He's coming on as a defensive, you know, analyst assistant. Um, But as much as, you know, they do have the Joe Judge connection way back in the day, I think this is more Jeremy Pruitt higher than anything. Jeremy Blunt. Carter Blunt. Jeremy Pruitt. You just you just combine the two names. Thrown off. Here's a fun fact. Carter Blunt looks like somebody that I know. If that's somebody that I knew, didn't like do a lot of drugs in their life. So Carter Blunt did not smoke a lot of blunts. No, no. And even if hey, if this person I knew stuck to blunt stuck to blunts, he probably wouldn't look. He would probably look more like Carter Blunt. But if you know, it's the hardcore. Oh, got it. Really got him. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um. Actually, I saw him the other day. <laughs> All right, uh, actually, <laughs> um, Who they else? also signed Ryan Anderson, so we now have two Ryan Andersons on the team outside linebacker. Now, mm-hmm. this one, there's really no connection. Uh, spent 2019 and 20 as the Elon safeties coach, 2018 Hampton defensive coordinator, was at East Carolina's inside linebacker coach from 2016 to 17, and then a Vanderbilt defensive assistant from 13 to 15. I can't find the connection on this one. Maybe Jerome Henderson. You know what? Let me look up. No, Jerome Henderson was been for the Falcons and the Cowboys the last 10 years. I don't know what the connection is. I believe Elon is also in South Car- South Carolina. He spent a lot of time know. in the Carolinas. Good vacation spot. I have no clue. But we, hey, we have a lot of coaches now. But guess what? You know who has the most coaches in the NFL? Who? Bruce Arians in the Bucks. He has 28. I can see that. They just won a Super Bowl, fun fact. Exactly. So we just killed like, too many cooks in the kitchen um, uh, uh, argument. How about you that? Mean, you can never have enough cooks in the kitchen. Myth busting, baby. All right, Justin, redraft. Redraft pick um, 99. Let's, let's try and keep this quick since we already spent 45 minutes on the tight ends. All right, so in our redraft, I have went, I went first round. I stuck with Andrew Thomas, stuck with my guns, and then I went Chase Claypool. When Chase Claypool, you went Justin Jefferson, who may be like the best player out of that draft, um, but you you got a big hold offensive line, and then you stuck with Xavier McKinney. Like you stuck with your Xavier McKinney pick, so I respect that. So at pick ninety nine, last year the New York Giants selected Matt Parrott. You and your mock draft picked Logan Wilson, linebacker who's with the Bengals and played pretty good, and I picked um, Florida Edge, who's with the Jets, Jabari Zuniga, who. Only played eight games, only played like 100 snaps, and really didn't do much. But I still got hope for the guy. Um, so that's who I want. Justin, who are you redrafting? You need an offensive lineman. I do, and I'm taking offensive lineman here. So Solomon Kinley is on the board. He's a guard. I didn't go with him. Um, you know who coached him, right? Oh, you didn't go with him. him. I did not. Rob Sale. Rob Sale. I th- there you go. Lloyd Cushenberry, I hate that he, you know, because Giants had the 99th pick. He went with the 83rd pick, or else I would have definitely taken him. 
Um, he could have been a center. And then my Nick Gates for my Nick Gates for left tackle campaign would have really kicked off somebody who I am going to take. Finley I need was a to Georgia guy. I'm sorry. I need to uh, Georgia. Yeah. I'm thinking of Robert Hunt, who was at the Dolphins too. Mike Hunt. Great guy. Tyree Phillips. I'm taking Tyree Phillips offense alignment from Mississippi state six, five, 331 pounds. Uh, I believe he was also measured at 335 pounds, possibly at the combine. Bobby, he's a big dude. He's a mall of the mall. The Baltimore Ravens put him at right guard. I don't really think he fit there and he kind of had a eh, kind of rookie season, but then they put him at right tackle. He had some good games. Um, he would be my right tackle or left tackle. I'm not feeling great about my my draft right now, but he played the majority of the games for the Baltimore Ravens. Baltimore Ravens, they have a pretty good offense, pretty good team. Uh, they believed in him enough to start him at two different spots. They might have screwed him up a little bit. I'd like to think the Giants wouldn't really screw him up and they would just put him at one spot because the guard spots were locked down for the majority of the year. Okay, so I don't know much about him, so I, I can't judge your pick, but I'm glad you got off the line. There's an offensive lineman who would be like a slam dunk here. Like I would take him the second round. The issue is I think our redraft is flawed now that I look back at it. Where it's like this guy, like there's an offensive lineman who was like, he would be the best pick here. Like if I was actually in a real draft, I would pick him here. But we already know the guys that are going to be available in our later picks. So there's a guy who went in the sixth round. It's like he would, he would have been my second round pick if I was really picking. But it's like he went in the sixth round. I don't need to waste that pick on there. Um, so you, I, I think you're going to have to wait to play the judge our things. So that being said, the guy I am going, defensive end, he only played 29% of the snaps for the Seahawks in 2020. But in 29% of the snaps, out of Syracuse, he had 22 tackles, four sacks, five tackles for a loss, four QB hits. Alton Robinson, remember we talked about him last year out of Syracuse. Yeah. I really liked Alton Robinson. There's some character concerns, but I like Alton. Um we are desperate in need for edge. Did any of our edge players have four sacks? And this guy did it on 29% of the snaps. Yeah. Alex Highsmith was also um we I thought about guy, him, but I like, he's guy I that like we talked Alton about. More. He had a good season. I like I, I thought about Highsmith, but I like all I like Alton more. Alton gets the snaps with us, and like that's really good production for that amount of snaps. Yep. So there's a guy I liked in the draft, good production on a low amount of snaps. Alton Robinson is my guy. I mean, he's our he's our leader of the room at the edge. So right now, I have Andrew Thomas, Chase Claypool, and Alt Robinson. You have Justin Jefferson, Xavier McKinney, and what's your guy's name? Tyree Phillips. Tyree Phillips. I don't feel great. Yeah, you, your sucks. I'm not. I'm not an. I'm not a good thing. I'm not a GM. No. Should we put out a poll of who's is better? <laughs> no. You you know what? Odds are this would be the random poll that I would win. You watch. You just watch. But people wouldn't know because they'd be they listen to the last two episodes. Oh, that's true. There's one pick you can get you can have later in this in the next two picks that would save your draft. I'm not gonna say it to you because I, I, I'm not gonna give it to you, but it's it's it would save your draft. But I'm clueless. I'm like looking at the list and I'm looking at the A V and I'm clueless. Hmm. Hmm. Clueless, clueless, Justin. All right, let's That's get what into what they call this. me in high school. It's a lot of a lot of nicknames for you in high school. <laughs> uh, let's let's get into the tight end draft preview. Bobby Skinner, before we get to the tight end draft preview, basketball teams are entering the final month of the regular season as they gear up for the playoffs. While some of the teams are locks to make the playoffs, others are still fighting for their opportunity to chase the trophy this summer. DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app, is putting you in the center of the action with a chance to turn $1 into $100 in free bets. Bobby, how are the Nets doing? Give us a Nets corner. We're winning the championship. It's over. Like It's over. You're even if Kevin we can we cannot have Kevin Durant and we'll still win the championship. That's how good the Nets are right now. Thank you for your next corner, Bobby. Turning $1 into $100 is simple. Pick any basketball team to win their next game. And if during that game, the team of your choosing hits a three, you bring home $100 in free bets. That's 101 odds. If the team of your choosing hits a three, they don't even need to win. 
They just need to hit a three pointer. This is one of those DraftKings bets where you, they they're like giving away free money. So download the top rated DraftKings sportsbook app now and use promo code John Boy when you sign up to turn one dollar into one hundred dollars in free bets if the basketball team of your choosing hits a three. That's code John Boy to turn one dollar into one hundred dollars in free bets for a limited time only at DraftKings sportsbook. Must be twenty one years or older. New Jersey, New Jersey, Indiana, Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com/sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call one eight hundred Gambler or in Indiana one eight hundred nine with it bobby tight ends tight ends we are going very top heavy because the class is the the tight end draft class is top heavy usually is i feel um yeah it's like we got our guys that we love and then it's like you know the end of the show is kind of like some like eh, you know like a, yeah. some very mad guys like usually we can find like hey even if this guy's undrafted here's why i should get excited about it um the end of the end of this doesn't have um that much that being said the beginning is very exciting, and that's where we're going to start, Justin. We are going to start from the Florida Gator tight end, Kyle Pitts. Six foot five, 245 pounds at his pro day. In 2020, in eight games, he had 43 catches, 770 yards, and 12 touchdowns on a 66 catch rate. So let's, man, doing the 17 game rate is going to be a lot different, but let's just say we're still at a 16 game rate. That's 86 catches. Over 1,500 yards, 24 touchdowns in an NFL season. Obviously, won't translate exactly to the NFL. Kyle Pitts has awesome speed for that size. It's not like the elite, elite, but he's running four, mid, mid four fours, maybe a four five. That's elite speed for that size. What really sets him apart is his catch radius and his leaping ability. His catch radius, radius and his leaping ability is nuts. And he has the hands, zero drops. Zero drops in 2020. Justin, a tight end having 10 deep targets would be a very high number. There's like two other tight ends who had that. He had 10 catches on 20-plus yard targets on 17 uh, targets. A true red zone threat. A contested catch king. Gets in and out of his breaks well. When you line about a wide receiver, he had matches versus J.C. Horn. And Patrick Sertain was winning those battles. That being said, he's not a good blocker. People are going to try and downplay play like, oh, he can be a good blocker. He's not a good blocker. He's not He's not a horrible blocker, but he's... Yeah, I, I've seen clips of him giving effort, but do you, do you feel like... I can like... pull up clips of Evan Ingram blocking NFL players really right. well. And I, I, can, I even remember what plays they are. Um, so he's not a good blocker. I view him as a Jimmy Graham type, and I think he can have that Jimmy Graham effect. And, you know, when obviously a lot of it had to do with Drew Brees, but when... The Saints had Jimmy Graham and Drew Brees working together well. I think they're the scariest offense in my lifetime. I mean, even that year we went to the Super Bowl, I was so relieved when the 49ers beat the Saints because I had never been more afraid of a team as a Giants fan yeah. than the Saints, not the 18-0 and Patriots. No, no, I was afraid of that Saints offense, especially in the Dome. Yep. So I think it can have that type of effect. Now, Justin, everyone who's listening already has their opinions on Kyle Pitts. So I'm going to ask you this. One, is there any chance he's there at an 11? And if he's there at 11, I know we talked about O-line. Are you taking him? I think there's a better chance he's not there than he is there. And if he is there, I, man, man, I I think you kind of got to. I think you kind of got to. I mean, you know, Dan Schneier, a good friend of the program. I think he he thinks uh, Kyle Pitts is the best non-QB in this draft. And are, are you on that boat too? Yeah, um, the blocking, it worries me. You know, we're getting excited. Like, you know, he comes to the league and it's just like not a great fit because he can't block. But I view him the same way I did Chase Young last year. Where it's like we desperately need an offensive tackle last year. Like it was desperate. But I'm not passing up on Chase Young. That's the way I view Kyle Pitts. It's like, you know, where's we don't desperately need any spot right now. So it's, it's a different than last year. But I'm, Kyle Pitt, tight end is a position where we have a guy like Evan Ingram who we're down on, but it's still – the coaching staff feels good. They just spent money on Kyle Rudolph. They restructured Tori Lolo. Yeah. And Caden Smith played 50% of the snaps. So tight end shouldn't be a need for the Giants. But Kyle puts – I don't think I could pass up on him. Yeah, I mean, it, this is where a lot of people talk about, oh, you, you got to take best player available no, no matter what. You don't draft for need. 
Um, I'd be I'd be interested to, to see, you know, a lot of people that say you have to take best player available no matter what, what those people think about if Kyle Pitts is there at 11, do you take Kyle Pitts? Because um, then it, because then it, uh, you, you kind of created a, a conundrum for yourself, especially at that point, Evan Ingram would have to be traded. Yeah, Bobby. Uh, please trade Evan. Trade Evan Ingram so we could get excited about these tight ends more. Like yeah. Matt, your guy. Like, if we trade Evan Ingram, I could get a lot more excited about all these guys. I thought we were going to start the show kind of just talking about the tight end spot as a whole. I think we're talking top heavy um, in this class versus, you know, maybe fourth, fourth round, third, fourth round and on. I think we're talking top heavy of this class because there's some good tight ends in this class, number one, that even like, even some of the guys that I'm going to be talking about, I would prefer them over Caden Smith and Levi and Toy Lolo. And I'm not saying that's the answer. That's why you draft a tight end early on. So then he's going to be your third string tight end. I don't recommend doing that, but uh, trading Evan Ingram on draft day to get, get another pick plus make room for one of these exciting tight ends in this class. That could be an option. I think it's a win-win to get, a guy like Engram off the team who was just so non-productive. He can be productive, but he was so non-productive um, to get another talented guy on here and to get another draft pick. I mean, I think that's a win-win-win. Um, Pitts, if he's there at 11, i say yes. Yeah, yeah, me too. All right, Justin, who is first on your list? Another guy I love. Yes, no, another guy I love and or, arguably – has a similar impact to Kyle Pitts when we're talking about the tight end position. Maybe not in terms of your offense or the athlete or the, or the football player as a whole, but the, if we're talking about the tight end spot, a guy that may even fit the Giants better. So, Pat Fryermuth out of Penn State, 6'5", 258 pounds. There could be something that's different for the pro days. So, Bobby, if you want to get mad at me, you get mad at me. 6'5", 251 pounds. Whoa, 6'5", 251 pounds. Thank you so much, Bobby Skinner. Um, <laughs> I'll talk about some of his 2018 and 2019 production um, in my actual review, but his 2020 production, he had four games. He had an injury. Um, he's tw uh, 23 receptions, 310 yards, 13 and a half uh, yards per catch, one touchdown. Um, in my plus plus category, Bobby Skinner, the baby Gronk comparisons are no joke. And it's not an exaggeration. I mean, where's the same number? Um, he went to uh, he went to school up in New England, too. I think he went to prep school up there, too. So the, the baby Gronk comparisons, uh, they're legit and especially they're legit in his play. And also they're they're similar in other ways. He is the perfect tight end for this Garrett Y option play. Most of his production came between the one and nine yard range at Penn State. Um, I can't tell you how many times Fryermuth ran that like intermediate route out route for Penn State. He just creates separation by the way he comes out of his breaks. He somehow creates separation on other routes too. And I, I, Bobby, I almost can't even describe how or why. And especially this is just like a tight end, like the really good elite tight ends in the National Football League. They're not the fastest guys like out there. Like Gronk was never a, a burner. Gronk was never fast. But these guys are just somehow able to create separation in the way that they run routes, whether it's their physicality, they're blocking guys out, they're shielding guys out, they're spinning around, wh whatever they're doing, uh, they're able to create it. And Fryermuth has like those, those traits. He was so, so relied on at Penn State, 27.8% target share in 2020. Even the tape shows the QB on most plays he is always like the first read. That's where the QB's eyes are going. And before the 2020 season, he averaged 12.7 yards per reception for 875 yards and a whopping 15 touchdowns in his first two years at Penn State. That is a touchdown catch every 4.6 receptions and 1.67 games. Everything is there and set up for him to be an elite tight end in this league. In my plus, in my plus category, he's a good blocker whose only flaw is that he is caught leaning. Um, but he has the physical tools to develop into a great blocker, blocker in the NFL, I feel. Breaks tackles and plays grown man ball too. If he's in blue, he's going to give us shades of Shockey and Bavaro and Giants fans are going to fall in love with him. Where Giants fans won't fall in love with him in my minus category is if he starts dropping passes. He has eight drops the last couple of years. However, from the games that I watched, there are some plays where passes that can be counted as drops aren't technically drops. He was hit pretty hard after the catch. Maybe it's a, it's a coin flip toss up if you feel like he should have came down with the ball. But if you start dropping balls, Giants fans are not going to like him. Um, lack of production when it comes to contested catches down the field. However, that doesn't push the needle for me since Daniel Jones isn't really throwing contested balls to our tight ends very often because he is throwing to the tight ends mostly in that one to nine yard intermediate range. 
overall, call me crazy, call me maybe, Bobby. I feel like adding Fryermuth does more for the 2021 Giants than any other skill position player, maybe besides Kyle Pitts. This includes the wide receivers. Adding Fryermuth, Pat Fryermuth, does more for this 2021 Giants than any other skill position player. Galde is going to be getting his 130-ish targets. Shep is going to be getting at least 80 targets, you feel. So the wide receiver room is, is limited. And if Engram is kind of shipped out, the tight end room is open. He's a got-to-have-it player for me. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'd agree with the over, you know, Smith, Waddle type guys. Um, I get for the what you're tw- for the, the by the way, let me clarify for the 2021 Giants. Yeah, I just I I think those guys are on on a level where it's like, so but I get what you're saying where it's like it's such an improvement over what we're getting, um, and you run two tight end sets with him and Rudolph. I mean, it would be a dream. It would be a dream. You would have to trade Ed Anger to to do this, but it would be a dream out there. Um, you know, he's not the perfect prospect. Um, but you know, he is a better blocker than, than a Kyle Pitts type. And you could tell like, like if he works at it, he's going to be a good block, like a, a good block in the NFL, maybe not like the Gronk Kittle range, but still, still pretty damn good. Um, but yeah. And, and you could tell there's stuff he can get better at. Like he can get better breaking in of his routes, but then you just, you see him catch a ball and just like at that size, be that fast and have that kind of yak after the catch. It's like, what? Like this doesn't even make sense watching no. him. So I, I I'm uh, I I heart Pat Fryermuth. Wholeheartedly agree. All right, next on my list. You know I love the guys from the U, <laughs> from the U baby, from Miami. Did a breakdown on this guy. He'll be out next week. Check it yeah. out. Brevin Jordan, my guy. I've had my eye on this guy for a few years. Obviously, I'm a Miami guy. Um, and by the way, oh, maybe I'll, I'll pull up the clip in a second. But anyways, I'll, I'll pull up the clip when you're talking about six foot three, 247 pounds, uh, 2028 games played 38 catches, 576 yards, seven touchdowns, 73% catch rate. You can do the 16 game rate in your head. 2019 played, uh, you know, nine games, 35 catches, 495 yards, two touchdowns. So interesting. In 2020, he played in the slot a lot. Like in line, he only played in line, like as as the Y tight end, twenty three percent of the time. But in two thousand nineteen, he did a sixty seven percent of the time. I thought he was pretty good at it. Obviously, in college, he did a little better at that at that slot spot. But they saw that, and they and going into twenty twenty, they changed that his role like a pretty good amount. Even though he was, he was pretty good in the Y role too. Um, good speed and awesome get off from the line of scrimmage. His route running is beautiful. It is crisp. His route running looks like wide receiver routes you like tight ends aren't supposed to run 20 yard posts he does it with cushion and gets that separation and turns it into big plays turns into touchdowns he has a lot he has great yak ability like you know i saw a tight end screen where he goes for 50 yards and is mm-hmm. breaking tackles like he is he just looks like a running back out there at times um his speed sets up the curl routes the in routes all the you know the sets up the route tree because defenses respect that speed corners safeties are opening their hips you can't cover him like he's you can't cover him with a linebacker uh, really good hands not going to be a go up and get it guy you know which you can sometimes want the tight end spies you know he's not going to go you know have these acrobat acrobatic catches um so like he's not going to be like a red zone threat with his size although his route running makes him um a red zone guy inconsistent as a blocker i think he's right around the kyle pitts level as a blocker um sometimes catches the balls the balls with his body um but i i listen i love the you guys but i I love brevin jordan is the eighth most deep yards in the country uh from this year now i can i can imagine if you're lining up mostly from the slot um and you're lining up mostly as wide receiver that could contribute to the deep yards but something that's significant that i particularly was finding um very helpful when looking at the tight ends and which tight ends stick out um, on the P- PFF's draft guide, they have all routes run and all targets. And I guess these players are wearing player tracking data because I don't know how else they would be able to track this. They track where most of their routes are being run. And then they compare that to the rest of college football and the rest of the position in college football in terms of how often 
is a player running that route more than average? Like, is it above average? Is it below average? Are they catching the ball? Are they being targeted um, shorter than like uh, at a, in the intermediate game more than more than above average? Longer game uh, more than above average? So they they track all of that. And the thing about Brevin Jordan is, all in terms of the routes that he runs, he is right around way above average. Um, post in between like 10 to 15 yards in terms of the routes that he runs. And it's towards the middle of the field, kind of close to the sideline, um, which I find that to be pretty significant, um, especially considering, you know, Bobby, you're talking about, he was spent most, most of his time at the slot. And this is a class that relatively doesn't really catch the ball deep. They very much live with between like the, they very much live in the intermediate part of the field. Here's him catching a touchdown at the cheese's bowl. Oh, yeah. And then I, I, and I Was that you boom. saying boom, boom, boom? Boom, 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 boom! With the fist pump. I got, I, I kind of emulated that from John Gruden. So I, I'm a space shuttle. All right. I'm a big Brevin Jordan fan. Justin, who's next? S- space shuttle? <laughs> How you know you live in Florida when a, when a noise shuttles happens? Anymore. They're rockets. We don't do shuttles anymore. Oh, excuse me. How you know you live in Florida? Next player on my list, Bobby. Bobby. Full bloom love. Full bloom love with Joseph Asai. This is officially the second player that I'm in full bloom love with. Tommy Tremble. Great name, too. Great elite football name. I mean, alliteration, too. Tommy Tremble, Notre Dame, from the University of Notre Dame, 6'4", 248 pounds. Limited production. Very limited production. Um, this year in 2020, he had 19 receptions, 218 yards, 11 and a half yards per reception, no touchdowns. 2019, he had four touchdowns, and pretty much the 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 production was the same in 2019. The only difference was he had four more touchdowns. Bobby, my plus plus category. He's a football player who loves contact. Uh, I'm finding a trend of guys that I'm just uh, gravitating to uh, every every year, and my trend this year is I just like guys who are like better or they're more or less football players more than they play a certain position. I, and I think Joe judge kind of likes that too, to be honest. I'm, am I saying I'm like Joe judge kind of, he wants to make contact. He's a football player who loves to make contact. Tommy tremble is another guy who just plays, but the different intensity compared to everyone else around him. He may fit better as a fullback in the NFL versus a tight end, but he very much can play both because of his experience as a pass catcher and his athleticism. Bobby, I was skeptical at first. I was skeptical because I was I was reading some things about can he be a successful fullback? And then the first game that I watched, he kind of primarily took a lot of his snaps at tight end. I'm like, can he play fullback or are people just saying this? No, I really think he can be a successful fullback in in the NFL. And also eventually when I started to watch more games, he did almost take as many reps at fullback as he did at tight end. He has a great ability to locate defenders to block, including when he works his way up to the secondary level. And I have this on my plus plus category for a reason. I feel like it's very hard. It's very hard to run like a bat out of hell to no, hit. Very, it is very hard <laughs> when watch. That's why when you watch him do it, it's so impressive. Yeah. to run like a bat out of hell full speed. And then while linebackers, you know, defenders, they're they're not trying to be blocked. They're trying to get around you to get to the ball carrier. So it's so impressive that he goes a bat out of hell full speed and he's able to stay balanced. He doesn't lean and he makes effective blocks when he's moving up to the secondary level. And he's a he's kind of more or less a tight end compared to a fullback. Like tight end was his is his technically his position. My plus category fires off the line and has insane explosiveness. This translates to both to him as a blocker, and I think it translates to him in the receiving game as well. He has some nice receiving abilities too. It was never really fully showcased at Notre Dame because of the rotation that was constantly at the tight end. My minus Curry, my minus category. He has a little bit of a drop problem, five drops on his 40 catchable targets, and he does not have enough play strength. Uh, No, I'm asking this as a question. Does he have enough play strength at the NFL level? He isn't as thick as your typical fullback or tight end. So I feel like he's kind of like in between here. He plays like a bat out of hell, but does he have the play strength? Overall, I think he is the best blocking tight end in this entire draft class. And what makes Tremble unique is that he is a good athlete too, which most blocking tight ends are not. Like we usually say, oh, oh, oh a blocking tight end, they're I, I call him a call him like a rumbler. Or, or they just they just rumble, rumble, rumble with the ball in their hands and they do nothing, they do nothing really spectacular. Oh, that guy's a blocking tight end. He's tight end number two. I think Tommy Tremble brings an interesting skill set. He will bring an interesting skill set to an NFL team. If Joe Judge is about hard-nosed, blue-collar smash football while preaching versatility, I think Tommy Tremble needs to be on the Giants' gotta-have-it list. He's also on my gotta-have-it list, Bobby. 
very he's a the most interesting player on probably we've done so far because you mentioned he played behind Cole Komet and then you know they had this freshman who they love in there um, Matt Mayer or Michael Mayer who took more reps than him and he does play both between tight end and fullback so he's basically like an h-back do it all type guy so I don't see him as like hey he's your fullback I think I view him as like hey this is your tight end who will line up and play some fullback reps um but you mentioned the 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 lead blocking is crazy. Blocking off the line, it's all right, but I don't like. You know, I'm going to talk about Trey McKitty next. I don't. I don't think he's on that level, and I don't know if that translates. But he's so fast, like he can be used as a receiver. He's so fast. He gets off the line of scrimmage quickly. Put this guy on drag routes, beautiful. Like you just put him on crossers, he's going to like, catch the ball and have some awesome yak. So he is definitely someone that like you you got to use him. But it's like, don't look at his stats and judge him off that because yeah. he has so much more than the lack of production he had at Notre Dame. Bobby, who do you view as a better football player, Elijah Penny or Mr. Tremble? Oh, Tremble every day of the week. I agree. Tremble is just like, Penny's not going to add add you anything as a receiver. Where Tremble, you can, as much as you like him as a blocker, I view him as the fourth best receiving tight end in this class too. Like it's, it's Pitts, Fryermuth, Jordan, and then Tremble. Like I really do think after these four, it's a dip. Like it's yeah. these four, and then we we've got yourself a nice serious dip after that. Yeah, he's he's on my gotta have it list because uh, ver- this is I I really f- I'm not even like thinking about like Joe Judge because I don't know I don't really know we don't really know what he likes we we know that he likes he preaches versatility but at the, at the end of the day we don't know what he really likes we don't know what Gettleman really likes. This guy is versatile and he's just very, very fun to watch. And especially he's being projected around like the fourth round. Fourth round, you're at a point where you're not really, you know, you're not really drafting for need, which I, I do think you draft for need in like the first couple of rounds. Uh, somewhat. Fourth round, you're at a point where you're taking best player. And if there's a tight end there that can do all these different things and he also could be a fullback for you, I think you got to take him. So I love this guy. Got to yeah. have it. I don't like your characterization of him as a fullback, though. He can be a fullback, though. That's he my point. He can take point. fullback reps, but he's not a fullback. You want to know who – and somebody on Twitter said this. I'm sorry I'm forgetting who. He'd be a perfect fit for the Jets because then he would be like the use check for, for Salah. Good yeah. fit for them. But he's somewhat like – use check is a fullback. I don't view Tem- Tommy Trumbull as a fullback at all. I view him as a tight end who can line up in the backfield in place and do give you fullback reps. Like when there was a movement to get rid of fullbacks and use tight ends as fullbacks – Tremble is what fits that role best. I don't know. He took a lot. It was almost. He did. I, wish, I know he did. I, I know wish he we did, could but... see the snap breakdown. I wish we could see that snap breakdown because it, it had to be close to 50 50. He, it, it, maybe even more, but I just like, I just view him as a tight end that sometimes lines up, that lines up in the backfield less than a fullback. That I'm doesn't make any it. sense, but, but it, it makes sense in my head. All right. Let's go quickly through the rest of these guys. Yeah. Not too quickly, but quickly. Trey McKitty, tight end out of Georgia, transfer from FSU, six foot four, two hundred forty-seven pounds. Two thousand twenty in four games, he had six catches, one hundred eight yards, one touchdown. Which I was surprised when I saw that because he's a guy I fell in love with at the Pro Bowl. He's a guy I fell in love with the Pro Bowl. He senior was making, Bowl, or sorry, yeah, the Senior Bowl was making one-handed catches, catching over the middle. Like he was very impressive. I was like, oh wow, this guy must like he must have been a good receiver for Georgia. He wasn't at FSU that, you know, he had, you know, 23 catches in 19 and 26 and 18, but it was more of a like dump off. You know, he wasn't, you know, like running routes downfield or anything. Um, But he is a really good blocker. I think he's, he, I think he's the best blocker um, in this draft class. Um, He just, he blocks like linemen do with the run game, moving his feet, nice hand placement. And he also moves guys in the path. You can even give him some path blocking reps. You don't want to put him on an Island, but he can do it. Um, Played all over slot Y and that H back role. Noticeably slow off the snap though. Like it, him getting off the line and getting to his routes. It takes time. It takes time. Um, We're at the senior bowl. You know, I'm not, I wasn't focused in on Trey McKitty. I was just watching the play develop, and, like, there's Trey McKitty coming all across the middle, having one-handed catches. Um, so, again, amazing hands, good ability to adjust to the ball. Decent route runner, especially at the stem, the top of the route. But, again, it's very slow getting to it. So, um, I was I went into Trey McKitty ready to get excited about him because of the senior bowl. But the film tells the story of a guy who's not going to be really much of a 
dynamic receiver. You know, I view him as like a Vasante Shanico. How about that for a throwback? Vasante Shanko, I think. It's correct pronunciation. Shanico. Shanico. Former Giant great before he was a Minnesota Viking great. Um, is he is he going to be around uh, Tommy Tremble range, like fourth round ish? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I okay. think there's a chance Tommy Tremble goes a lot higher than where he's projected. McKitty, I don't see that happening. That would make me happy. I would be happy for Tommy Tremble. I want to meet him. Tremble, Tommy Trembles. Um, and people love the Notre Dame guys too. So I mean, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of crossover. I hate Notre Dame. Why? Like they're like some players. You love sure. Tommy. Tre- two of your favorite players, Tommy Tremble and Dalen Hayes, are Notre Dame guys. They don't. I'm biased towards Dalen Hayes. All right, next on my list, Hunter Long. Another good name. Boston College, um, another bad guy move. I didn't write down the pro day or anything like that measurements. So 6'5", 253. What do you have? 6'5", 253. Wow. See, college football College football reference is right for once. I don't think he – actually, no, it is pro day. I always write PD next to it if it's pro day numbers. So it is pro day numbers. PD. Police department. Unreal production in, in 2020. Um, 57 receptions, 685 yards, uh, 12 yards per – Reception, five touchdowns in 2019. He had 28 receptions. That's a lot less. 509 yards, but he had 18.2 yards per reception. So he kind of like evolved into a different tight end towards the second half of his Boston College career where he was just much more reliable in 2020. And then 2019, he was like a big play machine. Um, in my plus plus category, his production at BC, like I said, it's no joke. And I, and I put production as part of the plus plus category. One game, he saw 17 targets, which is absurd. First downs on 60% of his catches in 2020. So even though the yards per reception was down, he was still getting first downs like 60% of his catches. Works the middle of the field very well and catches the ball in the face of contact very well. Solid speed and athleticism for his size. I describe him as a fast thumper. What did I say before? Did I say thumper? Because that's the word that I meant to use to describe a non-athletic tight end. Uh, A mass dumper. A mass dumper. Well, I describe Hunter Long as not a slow thumper that's not exciting. I describe him as a fast thumper after the catch. Um, He would demand double teams consistently from defenses as as well at Boston College. My plus category is a very good pass catcher. Three drops on 89 targets. Also does a good job catching the ball with his hands versus on relying on catching it against his body. Was targeted all throughout the field at Boston College. Um, Does a good job improvising his route running when QBs break containment. A ton of his highlight-worthy plays were improvised, which does fit a lot of NFL offenses and system in today's game. Solid catch radius, solid blocker. Not a bad, but not a great blocker either. My minus category, he's not going to physically dominate anybody as a blocker. So he's solid. He's he's, he's okay. Not going to physically dominate anybody. And his yards after the catch ability or as a route runner is... A little bit, little bit limited. Um, overall, Hunter Long is a very good prospect for where he's being projected to be. An early day three pick. He does not have a lot of holes in this game, but I don't really feel like he shines in any uh, or in enough areas to be considered one of the top guys in this class. The production and the re- and the reliance on him speaks for itself. He is a like it player for me. Yeah, he. I think he's kind of ra- like that average. Like yeah, he. In his routes, you can notice like he's physical in his routes. Like he understands who he is. He's physical in those type of routes, and those guys stay in the league for a long time at the tight end spot. And he's good at shielding defenders. So even if like he doesn't have the most separation, like he knows how to you know put his body in the spot to shield the defender off and make that catch. And you you say he's got good hands. So um, that's how I view Hunter Long. I think he's the most average out of this whole group. Like where it's like he's just he's just average. Like you can I can see him being a tight end too for 13 years in the NFL. Yeah. All right, next on my list. I had to do it to him, Justin. Had to. Duke gang. Duke gang. Two episodes in a row we're talking about Duke players. Maybe Daniel Jones had the greatest weapons in the world. Um, <laughs> no, no, just kidding. Noah Gray, tight end from Duke. Six foot three, 240 pounds. I want to, let's talk about his stats. I just, because I want to make a little point here. Mm. 2020 in 10 games, 29 catches, 285 yards, two touchdowns, 9.8 yards per catch. 67% catch rate. So try and keep up, people. 2019, 12 games, 51 catches, 392 yards, three touchdowns. So his usage went up a lot. 7.7 yards per catch, 72.4% catch rate. In 2018, while splitting reps with Daniel Helm, who was the number one tight end, in nine games, he had an 83.3% catch rate. It's a big difference. A very big difference. Why are you muting yourself? What's wrong? 
because there was some noise in the background. I didn't want people to pick it up. 11.7 yards per catch. So both of those all were his best. So he didn't have like the most catches of yards because he was splitting times with Daniel Helm, who had 24 catches that year. Isn't it funny that we've talked about two Duke players, Justin, in the last two episodes, whose sophomore seasons were magically better than their junior or senior seasons? I what what is the correlation? Is there, is there any correlation or causation there? Maybe now this I'm, Daniel Jones guy does I'm elevate focused. talent. Maybe now it I'm, does elevate talent a little bit, people. Now I'm focused on your background because now your plant is moving. Has it been moving this entire time? No, you're just noticing that, and that's the AC blowing on it. Shh. Now I'm going to use my shoulder to, um, Throw to cover that up. Throw it off. That's what, that's what happens when the my background's gone. It came down and my back screwed up, but I can't put it back up right now. So anyways, Daniel Jones elevates talent. Fight, uh, kick a rock. High school quarterback. How about that? Um. You love He's those. an old school, traditional tight end. Like he kind of does everything pretty good. Um, like he he's he's very good in route running. He understands zones. His routes are like very crisp and and flipping over. You know that Y stick. You know he knows when to flip the hips. You can use him out of the backfield a little bit. It's like a solid player. Catches the ball away from his body. You know. If there was one person that Daniel Jones could trust to catch the ball, Duke, it was Noah Gray. He had an 83% catch rate. You know, he only had four targets that he didn't catch. And I, I don't think maybe one of those was a drop. I can't remember. Um, great finding the holes underneath. Good blocking technique. Like, even like you look at him against JOK at Notre Dame, he did good at job blocking him. Um, here's the issue, though, Justin. He's six foot three, and he's just not that strong enough to really have that blocking translate to the NFL. And he's not like, he's not going to be the athletic freak to go and like, like, okay, well we can overlook some of that stuff. So if, if he, if you added two more inches to him and 15 more pounds, I think I, he would be like, and he still is like kind of in the middle tier of my tight ends. Um, but I just worry that it's not going to translate to the NFL because of those reasons where it's like, he, he can do that stuff well in college, but I don't know if he's gonna be able to do it well in the NFL. In terms of fit for Daniel Jones, uh, I talked before about, uh, I believe it was Brevin Jordan, I talked about that kind of uh, chart where all routes run versus all targets in terms of where players are targeting and if they're above average or under average, et cetera. And Noah Gray, in terms of where he is targeted and where most of his routes are, he's running them over, right over the middle of the field in between the hash marks, you know, in between that, you know, in between that five to 10, zero to 10 uh, yard range. So um, that fits well for Daniel Jones because he likes to use his tight ends as kind of like that, that check down guy, you know, and it really wasn't until we didn't really see Evan Ingram be productive until we forced Evan Ingram to line up as like a slot receiver and get most of his deep balls through that, through that area. So um, Noah Gray could fit day three pick using the way use our tight ends the way we use Caden Smith at the end of the 2019 season for the yes. love of God. That's when you saw, anyways, I'm, we're not doing that rant today. Well, All right, Evan Justin, Ingram next can't, on your list? Evan Ingram can't do that. Um, <laughs> who's next on my list? Briley Moore out of Kansas state, six, four, 255 pounds. Uh, Briley Moore in 2020 this year, only, only college football reference only has them in a, uh, only for 2020. 22 receptions, 338 yards, three touchdowns in nine games. Transfer from Northern Iowa. Transfer from, from Northern Iowa. Thank you. My plus plus category, another player that combines athleticism with an aggressive play style. His good burst off the line, which is film backs up. Solid pro day numbers. Not like an Evan Ingram that needs a second to get up to speed. He has a solid release off the line. Um, he is willing to get down and dirty in the run game. He showed off the strength. At the pro day with 26 bench press reps, and he has a solid pop at the point of attack as a blocker as well. In my plus category, he had an impressive touchdown catch versus Texas, Texas Tech, where he runs an impressive out route. He created some separation at that at the break point. He got hit pretty hard at the goal line, held onto the ball. That play showcases, I feel like, his good route running, his solid route running, his athleticism, steady hands, and ability to take a hit. He has the athleticism to kind of contort his body to grab balls that may be difficult catches for others. He also has Ward the number zero, which I think is an awesome number. I feel like it just really fit him well. My minus category, very, very small arms for a tight end, like second percentile short. Getting extension on blocks in the NFL problem in the NFL, at the NFL level may be a problem, um, and he, he may also have a somewhat of a limited catch radius for it. Overall, 
Moore is projected to be drafted around the fifth round. At this point in the draft, I think you would rather take a chance on somebody who plays hard and is a good athlete rather than just, rather than just like one of those big thumpers at tight end. Um, he has a lot of upside for where he may be drafted. He is a like it player for me. Justin, nobody was affected by bad QB play more than Bradley Moore. Mm. Kansas State quarterback sucked. I mean, there's like, oh, there he is. Angle route, touchdown. <laughs> Ball in the dirt. QB freaking sucked. Piss me off. Piss me off. Piss me off real good. All right, Justin, next on my list, another senior bowl guy out of Ole Miss, tight end, Kenny Yaboa. Yaboa Constrictor, six foot four, 250 pounds, um, 2027 games. 27 catches, 524 yards, six touchdowns, 19.4 yards for catch, 81% catch rate. Lane Kiffin, what he did for that old Miss offense is, is unreal. Um, transfer from Temple. So we've talked about two transfers from Temple mm. so far. Do you remember the last one? Quincy Roche. Quincy Roche. There you go. Um, good athlete who's v- very capable of big plays, and you obviously see it in the stats. Um, best fit is on like those crosser routes, but uh, like, you know, you put them, you put them where it's like kind of just run routes, you know, crossers, wheels, like th- those kind of things. But he's because he doesn't run the most crisp routes. Um, good catch radius and and good ability to adjust the ball in the air. Uh, a lot of scheme production at Ole Miss. Like I said, what Lane Kiffin did for that offense is unreal. You mentioned rumbling and bumbling. This guy's yak comes from that where it's like, oh, he should get tackled. And it's like, oh, he's just rumbling, bumbling, stubbling for an extra five, six yards. Um as a blocker, he's got good hand and like and helmet placement. And I hate to say this about a, a guy who's you know going to play in the NFL. He blocks kind of like a pussy. Yeah, like he is Whoa. very hesitant as a blocker. Like he looks like he just doesn't want to like make contact with players. Wow, it's crazy. I don't get it. He has the ability, so that's my big worry with him. It's like, dude, he does. It's like, it's like it's like he's trying to play patty cake with the defender. I don't get it. That's a strong comment. I know, but it's true, man. And I li- I want to like this guy, but it's just like, dude, go out there and like try at least. I'm not saying it's because of effort, but it's just like he looks timid when he's blocking. It doesn't make sense. Maybe it's because I'm getting older, but I'm really old. Maybe it's because I'm getting older, but I like I, I am more attracted if you, even if you're an average like player at your position, if you just play the game hard, I'm gonna like you more. Is that because I'm young? Is it because I'm, I just appreciate good play? I don't know. Is it because I'm naive? No, I think that's a good take. I, I always look for those guys. Yeah. That's why it's like, I, that's why I don't hate Evan Ingram because it's like, he tries. Yeah. It's like, he's not like, it's not like he's not a hard worker. He just can't catch the damn ball. <laughs> he tries um, very hard. Try your hardest, do your best. Um, some people say Tony right, Poljan. Tony Poljan. You, Love this player, Bobby. He's from Virginia, 6'7", 265 pounds. Um, I'm not even going to read. He, 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 nah, should I read off his, what, let me just check his stat sheet. Anything in, anything in particular? Six touchdowns in 2020. Yeah. They, oh, they don't have, they don't have his page updated. They don't have a pro, college pro football. Oh, we need to, I'm going to write a letter. College football reference does not have his page update. I'm going to write a letter on, on his behalf. Bobby he was a former QB in high school. He threw for 58 touchdowns in his career and ran for 58 touchdowns as well. And when he initially started his uh, college career at Central Michigan, he threw for 703 yards before switching to tight end. Since he has converted positions, he is automatically a future Hall of Famer in Bobby Skinner's eyes. Um, Fun fact, Bobby even tweeted and said that Paul Jan is his favorite player in the draft so far. So I'm excited to hear what he has to say. Nothing else in my plus plus category because he's not that good of a player. Plus category, he's a, he has a solid catch radius, and again, he's just massive. That's why he has a solid catch radius. Solid run blocker. That's where Paul Jan's going to probably make a Paul Paul Jan. Yeah, that's where Paul Jan's going to probably make his money as a pro. I keep on getting Paul his last name Paul Jan with Pojlan because that's how I initially wrote it down. So now it's in my head that I that I'm saying his last name wrong. Um, He's basically almost the same size as his tackle to begin with, so I would hope that his run blocking is really good. Um, he made a bananas catch against Miami, Bobby. I'm sure you remember that. He made a really bananas catch. It would have been an incomplete pass in the NFL because he only got one foot down, but it was a nice catch regardless. Um, overall, this is the first tight end on my list where I'm just watching, and I'm saying, yup, you're basically just a backup tight end in today's NFL, and that's kind of boring. He's a like-it player for me. But, Bobby, you love him. He's, I mean, he's tall, skinny. He's very slow, has no agility. Um, and then his run blocking, he's going to get called for holding in the NFL. His hands are always outside the shoulders. 
he doesn't drive through guys, but he's because he's big, he's able to get away with it in college. Um, so some decent production, you know, good good feel, but he's just he's just very slow and has zero agility. Uh, C minus. Oh, great! Your first grade of the draft month. Well, I have grades for all these guys. I just usually don't say them out loud. Oh, um, another C minus guy. NC State tight end. We're staying in the ACC. Uh, Carrie Angeline, Angeline, it's another six foot six, 245 pounds, very similar to Poljan. Um, Poljan. S- similar stats 27 catches, 412 yards, six touchdowns, 77% catch rate. Um, slow. His 40 time is probably gonna be close to around the fives. Like his pro day 40 was like a 492. I was faster. So in, in real, yeah, in real life, he's, he's gonna be he's slow. Not a, bl- a bad blocker, but he's not gonna move anybody. Looks like a big wide receiver. Like he looks like, oh, this guy would be a good wide receiver. Um, but again, he's just kind of slow. Doesn't have really good agility. Um, not going to get you any yak. Um, production comes from working the seams. You know, put him on a you know a vertical working the seams. He has a good feel for zone. Um, and he's he's big. Like I said, he's six foot six, but he's not a leaper. Uh, another C minus guy. Bobby. Last but not least. Awesome name again. I keep on running into guys with great names. Pro Wells, and I'm not picking them on purpose, by the way. I am looking at their play, and then I'm then I'm saying, hey, they have a good name. I'm not doing that on purpose this time. Pro Wells, TCU, 6'3", 249 pounds. Um, in 2020, he played seven games, 13 catches, 195 yards, 15 yards per catch, three touchdowns. That's kind of bizarre. Um, he also had 17 catches in 2019 and five touchdowns. It's kind of a good rate. Um, my plus plus category for pro Wells contested catches. That's what he's known for. It's rare to have a tight end um, who has the experience Basketball to go player. up. Basket, I, you know what? I was about to get to that point. It's rare to have a tight end that just goes up and, you know, gets these balls in the air, especially ones that are being projected to go so late. Um, Wells has it. He has that basketball mentality that you want your tight ends to have. However, he took most of his snaps out wide. Um, 200, 200 of his 270 snaps came from the slot. He is a vertical threat. Like I said, averaged 15 yards per catch in 2020. Eight total TDs the last two years. Average depth of target was approximately 13 yards, which is top 10 um, in the country amongst tight ends. But of course, you have to make a little note that those snaps were not coming from in line. They were coming from the slot. Plus category does a good job working back to the ball. Great name. Already mentioned it. Some may say a pro's name. Not sure if there's any relation to Vernon Wells, former MLB player. My minus, David my minus, Wells, actually, huh? David Even, Wells, he's related to. Oh, he he is. No. Oh, lack of production, lack of experience as an inline tight end. That's my minus category. Um, I think he just has overall limited film on blocking because he has the lack of snaps. Yeah, he's just like they just didn't let him block. Like they just like, hey, you're not gonna block. So we don't know. Um, and Bobby. Even in a year where pro day numbers are juiced, TCU certainly didn't do a good enough jobs a job for Wells uh, in terms of juicing them. Uh, all all across the board, Wells' uh, uh, pro day numbers were very, very bad. He's kind of slow. Um, so he's a contested catch king. I like Basketball it. player with a nice catch radius. That's, yeah. th- that's, my, that's my thoughts on pro Wells. C minus. All right. We appreciate you guys. We'll be back on Tuesday talking about cornerback safety. I know. I don't, I don't want to talk about we're, we get we get cornerback safety on Tuesday, and then we start getting like interior offensive line, inside linebacker, offensive tackle, wide receiver. And then we start freaking rolling, baby. So we appreciate you guys. We'll see you on Tuesday. Until then, let's go big blue. <laughs>